George Ferguson, um, when he was um, president of the ROBA, um, suggested that the Academy of Urbanism should be founded. Um, the first person he called was John Thompson, and the first person that John called was, was Kevin Murray. Um, and Kevin has been a director since the earliest days. Now, we only have nine-year terms as directors, uh, and that was 13 years ago. And that only works because the company was reformed after three years, as I understand it. It all sounds a little bit dodgy to me. But, um, Kevin has been a director since the very beginning of the Academy, but he can no longer carry on claiming that it's only been nine years. So he's, he steps down um, at the end of January as director, um, and as part of that, um, we, wanted, we wanted to invite him to give his valedictory address on what he's learned from those years as urbanism. Um, Kevin needs no introduction, but Kevin was the youngest ever president of the RTPI, is that true? I mean, there was someone in the Second World War. <laughs> <laughs> Second youngest ever president of the RTPI, which is not quite a stupid thing. Uh, Kevin Murray, um, I, I, it's my privilege to introduce Kevin, so... Thank you, David, and, and thanks to the Academy, because um, I don't often get to talk in, in this way. Normally, people recognize me as the person who does the workshops or the summarizing at workshops at Congress or somewhere else. So it's quite nice to be able to, to present. Um, can I give a warm welcome, not just to all the regular academicians, but it also some, any Anyone here who's new, it's the first time to an event, welcome. Anyone who is returning, I recognize some of you haven't been to Academy events for a while, so a warm welcome um, to this. Um, the most important thing, I always find I get the admin job. Normally it's the toilets and the fire escapes, but tonight it's the, um, it's the Wi-Fi. So if you're wanting to get on and, and follow some other interesting news, um, that, that's the network and the password. But if you were tweeting, uh, or, or anything like that, it's hashtag AOU review, uh, which is what's been used on during today. Um, a little apology to start with. If any of you have come thinking that I'm talking about landscape, um, in urbanism, in this sense, um, apologies, I'm not. Um, even as exciting as Birmingham can be, uh, when we went there, I'm not talking about that. So I'm not talking about landscape in urbanism, even where it is innovative, as there in Turin, with creative gardens and sensory gardens, or in extreme forms with the uh, Eco Hotel there at Vauban in Freiburg. So none of that. I'm really talking about urbanism within its territory. So the space that we occupy, or have come to occupy, because some people didn't even know what urbanism was 10 or 20 years ago. And when we were being formed back in 2005, um, it was my job as the kind of, one of the detailed people along with um, Brian Evans, but particularly here, uh, uh, Robert Adam and John Billingham actually, how do we position ourselves in amongst all these other organizations in that territory? Um, and I should say, as someone who ended up being on the board of the ASC as well, there was a, a little bit of split personality um, to the role. So for a lot of people, urbanism is about townscape and the physical layers of place, like this example of Bologna, and we have tended to use that in our, in our grey background. But I want you for a moment to think of urbanism as a clearing, as a clearing between forests, as an open area, maybe as a campsite. So think of it as, as green territory, uh, maybe even lawns. In the beginning, uh, there was the government, um, and as we knew it in the early 2000s, it was ODPM, uh, the Office of the Deputy Prime Minister, one that was actually quite keen on, on this theme and topic. Um, and there the tended to be the professions out there, not completely siloized, as I'll explain, but that th th they provided one role. And in and the, and the preceding decades, a number of key organizations and networks had grown up. Um, the TCPA coming out of the Garden Cities movement, an earlier part of the century, Bura, the Urban Regeneration Association, and of course the Urban Design Group, who were architects in planning emanating from the RIBA in 1978. And then later on, towards the millennium, we had others. 
So coming out of Urban Villages Forum was the Princess Foundation. Coming out of a network of people, and I worked with the likes of David Locke, with Rob and, and others um, in a whole range of professions in <coughs> the Urban Design Alliance on the top right. And then, of course, along came a cave, effectively a successor to the Royal Fair Art Commission. So you can see that this green space or this clearing in the woods mm -hmm. or this campsite was already getting quite crowded uh, when the idea of introducing an academy came along. But there weren't just one, we got two. We got the Academy of Sustainable Communities and we got uh, the Academy of Urbanism. The Academy of Sustainable Communities was going to be called the National Centre for Sustainable Communities um, and that got changed. That was the, so the, the grey ones are the public sector ones, the independent professions are in yellow and, and the, the civil society NGO type ones and networks are in orange. So quite crowded space really. And at the time, some people argued against us, saying, why are you coming along into our territory, parking your tanks on our lawn? I thought, didn't know we were doing that. We were just trying to create a network. Um, and the network originally was going to be 100 people uh, whose backgrounds were in different strands of urbanism. Over time, fewer went. In the years of the crash, some of you will know, some of you will know quite painfully because you may have been active supporters uh, or, or awards assessors or whatever. We also lost UDAL in its form. There are still networks, but UDAL in terms of the, the, the real driving force that it was moved off the scene, as indeed did the ASC. The ASC, which came into the, to being the same time as us, had about 5.2 million pounds a year in budget. It got merged into the HCA at the time and then gradually disappeared. We lost the Princess Foundation, as was. There is still a Princess Foundation, but it's a different, it's a merger of different things. But the, the form that it was in before, a bit like Civic Trust Regeneration Unit, uh, before it uh, went. And then, of course, we lost CAVE in the form that it existed in before. So there is still a CAVE or a legacy. So they've all got smaller legacies. So there we are in a different environment. In the uh, early 2000s and teens, really. So the academy is growing and it spawns the young urbanists. Why? Because a business model of an organization of 100 people, mainly over 50, isn't actually going to survive very well. <laughs> and you're not going to get much money from the bank. Um, given that most of them were actually over 60, uh, they're very active over 60, but there is a succession issue. The Place Alliance came along effectively substituting UDAL in time uh, as an umbrella network. Um, but what was critical in the change in the years since 2010, and uh, very significant, is the role of communities. They were always significant to most of us, but they had a more formal status within the planning system and particularly through neighborhood planning. Local government became important because it had to enable that, even though that was often because its own resources were diminished, sometimes in terms of skills. And interestingly, and this is maybe a big shift, thank goodness people like me would say that the, R, the research assessment exercise and the RES stopped focusing on just meaningless research and publication of papers and actually started working with communities and trying to have a, an impact and a positive impact on the communities in which they're hosting. Apologies to Rob um, for using one of his um, diagrams here, but what the Academy came to the conclusion was we were not about the design debate, good or bad. Um, and, and Rob's been one of the great advocates of, of that tension between meaning and understanding of place, space, place, design. Our, our view was that we were about promoting dialogue, discourse, yes, research, that was the academic bit, but also it was about sharing good practice, uh, celebrating achievement where people made it, often from quite difficult circumstances, but crucially the shift for us was in supporting real places and communities. <clears throat> what John Worthington called from the earliest days place partnering. And we almost didn't know what that was as, as we were evolving. So that was the first point about institutional legacy. Second point, I've only got 20 points, so it won't take too much. <laughs> we all have baggage. That is a group, a typical cross-section of academicians. And in there, there are planners, there is a charter surveyor, there's an economist, there's an urban designer, there's an architect, there's a landscape architect, there's a community development person, there's a 
a tourism person, there's a leisure person, you get my drift. I am coming from a planning tradition, so I'm from one strand. I actually have the t-shirt. I literally have in my bag the planning t-shirt signed by Rob and others a few years ago. So they do exist, it's not just a, a, a myth. There is such a thing. John Thompson got in touch with, with me at the beginning, but I've got to pay tribute to um, uh, Brian Evans because he was the one who badgered me and said, are you going to join this or not? And I said, oh, it's really difficult because I'm, a, I'm in the John Prescott, the other academy, and I'm going to be in the board of that, and I'm all the game. He said, no, no, we, we really want you. So, so they, they uh, press ganged me into this and said it was going to be great. I just want to pick up this issue of legacy. We came with baggage from the RIBA in the first instance. Some of you will know, some of you were involved. In, in the year of the, the fact, we were meeting during some of the bomb scares in, in 2005. So George Ferguson in his presidential year pushed for it. Um, we, we didn't have a comfortable fit with the planning uh, people at RIBA, so we wanted independence from that, but that was part of the legacy. A number of people came from the Urban Villages group, which had morphed into the, the Princess Foundation, and that was an important one in terms of the ecology of developers and designers uh, uh, and so on working together. Another part was the urban design group. A large number of this uh, grouping were urban designers or urban design supporters. So they came from that group, and there were some, uh, who shall remain <coughs> nameless, who said, why don't you just join our tent instead of parking another tent uh, in the territory? But one of the biggest influences, and John Thompson, who I've been in touch with in the last few days, and by the way, John is due to get out of hospital tomorrow, uh, all being well, so we're looking forward to seeing him tomorrow. The message I just got said, we'll see you in the pub. What? <laughs> so um, his view was that that was a driving force because so many of the practitioners, the David Locks, the Will Allsops, the Derek Lathams, people like myself and Brian and, and others, we all met and we discussed urbanism and towns, and we worked with communities. We worked with real communities in Grimsby and Scunthorpe and Scarborough and so on. He said that was a driving force. And the other one outside, over the pond, was the Congress of New Urbanism, where a number of people met up with uh, like-minded urbanists, some of them very traditional, some about transport de uh, dependency and rethinking transport and density, uh, but the idea of convening and bringing them all together once a year was a big theme coming from there. So, um, those were the influences. So they weren't necessarily the RTPI or government or the RIBE itself, it was really George who was a driver. That gives you a little flavor. So this is the Sharabang, we set off, I hate to use this because it sounds like something out of Strictly, um, come dancing, but we set off on a journey and we grew from the original, we pretended we were 100, we were only 70. Uh, we grew into 100 and then 200, you see, you end up needing, over time, a bigger bus. Um, and we visited, studied, and shared the learning from a whole range of different places. Um, you can see there at the Olympic site, and then up in Birmingham. We got to the point where we were almost not frightened to go anywhere. We went on boats, we went on planes, we went on trains, we, we loved trams, I've got to say. Um, that's Gothenburg, and, and that's uh, Istanbul. The issue here is that we wanted to celebrate learning and the way into it very quickly, I'd have to say John decided, ahead of most of this, is the awards. We need a mechanism to recognize, validate, and share the learning. So the awards became the, the, the vehicle. That's Grey Street, one of the, the, the early winners of the Great Street, I think after the Royal Mile. And we got criticized. We got criticized because we were picking um, idealized chocolate box places, as we were told, places that were already great, and places that were attractive and beautiful in this country and abroad. And it's true, we did quite like visiting them, but we wanted to study and understand why are these places good, why do people like them, why do they like, we like being in them. Um, but it did get difficult when we were dealing with places like here in Oslo or, or here in, um, in Aarhus, that people felt they couldn't easily replicate. So what's the learning? So sometimes the learning was about commissioning, sometimes it was about aftercare, it wasn't always about design uh, per se. But we did, all the time, look at streets and places and neighborhoods that were gritty. And here was the Custard Factory in Birmingham, uh, in Digbeth, one of the early winners uh, in, in that category. But the awards um, were not easy as a sell. People liked the celebration, 
But I remember, I don't know if Derek's here, but Derek Latham saying to me, um, if he's not, I'm going to say, this is Derek Latham, whose wife was the Conservative Mayor of Derby, now the Conservative MP for Derby, <laughs> saying, it's a little bit awkward coming to an award like that with all my Labour Authority clients, um, because it, it feels a bit too grand. I was thinking, okay, Derek, I'm sure you're used to it in, in the Houses of Parliament. If Derek were here, he would reinforce it. It was difficult, because we were meeting in Park Lane in big hotels, because we had the sponsorship, but we wanted to make a splash, we wanted to make an impact. And we can't continued it, and obviously we've scaled that back a little bit, and it's a bit more funky and a bit more community-facing. But the awards were important because people had been working sometimes for decades to improve their town or their neighbourhood or their street, and we wanted to recognise that and validate it. But we wanted to understand what they'd done and how they'd done it, because their story could help inspire others. So we captured some of the, the, the material, the, the plans and, and so on, in Space Place Life, uh, and also, they got the wonderful poem uh, from Ian McMillan, which I think was a masterstroke, which, which people are very proud of today. And we've seen people almost reduced to tears, either uh, hearing their poem, I remember the Lisbon one, for example, hearing their poem um, from Ian McMillan, or trying to deliver it themselves. I thought, for instance, Paisley were wonderful this year. So there was huge pride in those and in the achievement, but the learning is what mattered. What, I don't know if there's anyone here from JTP, but. John Thompson's office used to call Thompson's tours the visits to places to study and share. And it was a bit like that, and that's, a, that's not even the up-to-date map. I mean, there, there are many more to add to that. But there were tours, and that is almost like um, the board, if you are sitting in, in, in um, Schiphol or Frankfurt Airport, that's almost what you'd see above you. That's only the European cities, never mind all the other places we visit. But just think of the learning in there when you're meeting and sharing the information with officers, with community members, with businesses, and very often we're meeting the mayors and the senior politicians too. That is a huge amount of learning to get out there and share. There you go, we love the trans. Uh, but, and we met, the, the, the mayor of Turin, fantastic guy, he, he said to me, uh, do you know Donald Dewar? I go, Robin Cook, and uh, John Smith, and I thought, I yeah, but they're all dead. Um, <laughs> those were the guys he, he knew when he grew up. Now, this is where it gets difficult. But <coughs> the issue is that's a key policy person in Bordeaux um, discussing with, with Ginty uh, some of the learning. And, and it does look idealized, and it doesn't look like it necessarily applies to us. But they did an enormous amount of work to transform the downtown working waterfront of Bordeaux. It doesn't look like it today. You need to understand the story. So that looks very genteel. We put that into books, and I've got to thank Frank and Brian and for the other books. Uh, I've, I've got to thank uh, David, Rob, Sarah uh, for the important work. So the first uh, two books are there. Uh, I actually wrote it, again, people think all I did was chair meetings, but I actually wrote chapters in each of those. And then we, we started the journal, or as we, we called it at the beginning, the magazine. Now, although I came up with the title, um, it wasn't mine. That baby was, was um, Sarah, uh, Sarah Chaplin and her husband Eric. They came up with the idea, and I think the team have done a great job uh, developing that and converting that into a real quality product. This issue of conversion into something meaningful was always an aspiration for particularly John Thompson in the early days. Now, you've got to remember, there are, there are community activists, there are academics, there are a lot of geographers, you know, it doesn't matter what you do now, a lot, we found a lot of people in the academy ultimately were geographers. So we often knew about all these layers, and John said, if only we could bottle all the information and all the layers in some form. And we tried in various guises, we tried to write up a report in Liverpool on this, just in the middle of 2008, just as the crash, I think we were there in October as the crash was happening, um, and somehow we never got around to it. But then we got another opportunity to write it up as a charter, a charter of sustainable urbanism, which we did uh, in Freiburg, on the back of Freiburg holding the title of European City of the Year. Uh, and there's the group that went out and wrote the charter. Uh, we ran it as workshops. It will be hard for most of you to tell now that some of those people did the workshop on the charter, having not gone to bed the night before, dancing all night in a nightclub, and then turning up at uh, Glassy Island. Uh, and I can tell you, it was really hard to get them to work in that workshop. What are the lessons from these places? Well, one of them was around place leadership and innovation. Hamburg, for instance, 
very much addressing climate change. Uh, in their instances, the, the elf water, both, both uh, tidal and the water coming downstream, and, and lots of people have lost their lives down in that part of the harbour. Alternatively, a different scale of urbanism from somewhere like Antwerp didn't get the scale of investment as a London or a Paris or a Barcelona or, or a Berlin, but still needed to do things that were a smaller scale in terms of interventions, both space and building interventions, to change their neighbourhood. The example on the right is an old garage converted into a library, which made what was a rundown area, an unsafe area, into something that was an attractive and convivial space in a dodgy neighbourhood. In other words, it was making it more attractive and safer. So much of this we learned from different places was down to a combination of place leadership. The officers, like a city architect here, Stephen Willisay, AOU on the left, and his leader, Jacob Bunskar, who quite frankly, now that many of us know, he could end up as Premier of Denmark. But he is, is a driven, a socially conscious local leader. And it was people like that in all sorts of different cities. We found Antwerp was an example that I can think of. Um, we're making a huge impact, not necessarily in one year, in two, but in three, four, five, six, seven years. And that's what really mattered. Uh, to have a, this is the mayor's book, uh, uh, which we don't have in English, but it was, it, it was all about rethinking space and rethinking place and rethinking the city, prioritizing people. So to try to squeeze out um, cars, try to squeeze out uh, undesirable activity, try to make it more convivial, often in an experimental way. And I'll pick something up about that more uh, later. But this is the kind of work that some of us saw. Uh, we actually saw it in, um, or who's those of us who went, and we, we've seen it in the stories that have been told. So in the learning from this in the early to middle years, we started to pick up, and I can think of Helsinki and Oslo. Uh, I can think of um, Budapest. And this is in addition to some of the leading British and Irish cities who were doing great things uh, to transform their places, is that the idea and the plan was important, but it wasn't enough to do that. There are lots of people with ideas and plans. You had to implement it and make a positive impact on the time. Usually in a mayoral term, or what we would call a local authority administrative cycle. But you then have to build on that and do it again. So the Green Mayor in Freiburg benefited from the work of the preceding Social Democratic Mayor, and they built on year on year. So that over time, it has a considerable impact. You can see the impact on the place, whether it's a city or a neighborhood, is quite high over something like 20 years. <coughs> and those are the mayoral cycles that follow through. The risk is, as we sometimes have, is that you get a different administration come in, they don't like what's they've done before, they rip it up and they start again. And they do something. But it doesn't relate to or build on what's gone before, because they may be ideologically opposed to it. You then get someone else come in, try a different route. And you can see there that in those examples, they're not cumulatively impactful or beneficial. You might know someone. Here's another option. You have an idea, you don't have the skills or knowledge to implement the plan, and you don't have the money. You kick it around for a while, and you get a new administration, and you develop a new idea, a new plan, a new approach, and you maybe get a bigger name architect to draw it up, or a plan, world famous plan. Doesn't work either, you get another one, so you can see what's happening. You have plans, but you have no implementation. And the place, the impact on the city, isn't even static. Because over a series of cycles, you're not only losing confidence, you're losing competitive edge against the other places. And that's where we find so many of the European cities and towns, and we're dealing with towns of 250 to, to a million at scale normally. We weren't really looking at the, uh, the likes of Paris um, and so on. So what we find is, they had a vision and they had milestones to achieve it. This is the half and story one, uh, sorry, the half and city one, but the story could equally apply to somewhere like Dundee Waterfront. Here is Dundee Waterfront where they had that vision. You can see the ideas and the aspirations from a, a decade ago. People didn't really believe it. They didn't think it could be funded. They didn't think it could be delivered. And they didn't really think it could be done in Dundee of all places. Goodness me. That was the view. People in Aberdeen started realizing this was going to happen, and of course they were terrified because they thought everyone is going to go to Dundee, which of course is what we did a few weeks ago as an academy, 
and everyone thinks it's absolutely stunning, it's world class. So if you haven't been already, go. It, it's really distinctive. Um, it adds something to the city and arguably it adds to the coastline of, of the whole country. So well worth a visit if you get a chance. But it's that kind of long-term vision that is important for cities, something that delivers even through the vicissitudes and, and, and the vagaries of um, political change. And sorry, Dundee has had political change in that time. It hasn't been an easy sale. So what about at a different scale? In streets and places where we've assessed things from the beginning, we haven't just been concerned about towns and cities. We've also looked at streets and spaces and neighborhoods. Uh, and here we have, this is Coburn Street, which wasn't a winner in Edinburgh, uh, but it did have attractive mixed use. It's probably a bit too dominated by tourist activity uh, for the academy to be totally convinced by it. Here's the one, someone said this in Patrick Street win. Exmouth Market won that year. Uh, St. Patrick Street and Court did not win the Great Street. Exmouth Market won it for a whole range of reasons. Um, I guess because many of the academicians were familiar with it and it uh, in Morrow, but that's a different issue. Uh, but he managed to have walking, cycling, mixed use, um, and even a past president of the RIBA in one of the buildings. This kind of how can we make the best use of the public space for the public for a whole range of different players was something that was being experimented with in a whole range of places. So things like car free Sundays uh, were being trialled in, in a whole range of places in Bordeaux, here in Gothenburg, and you can see that car free doesn't mean segway free, uh, it would seem. But the idea was to make them more convivial, more attractive, particularly for families, um, and, and change the whole look and feel of the place. And I know when we went to Bordeaux, uh, we arrived on a Sunday, George Ferguson was so impressed, he copied it as one of his key ideas uh, for Bristol. The idea of places where you could simply hang out, streets and spaces, and the one on the right is a tram stop. If you can imagine a bus stop in many of our places being a place that, that's comfortable for people to hang out, it's difficult to imagine, but that's the kind of thing that uh, was being applied in some of these places. Safe, comfortable, yes, it, it, does matter that the climate is different, but sometimes we don't allow it, you know, our house gets cold and wet too, just as many of our, our towns and cities. But it's the, the, the shift in approach. Remember, many of you, if you don't already know, that part of our house was a street. That was a commercial street that the politicians had the power, the, the, the vision and the powers to dig up, reopen as a, cul a once culverted stream and make it into a place again uh, using the water. It's kind of partially dammed at the other end to keep the water level high. Um, so that, that created, if you, uh, does anyone watch, um, what's it called? Dicta. Does anyone watch Dicta Crime Reporter? That's the, it's, so it's like a female version of the Taggart. If that, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's well worth viewing, so it's like Scandi Noir Detective. <coughs> And you'll see lots of it filmed around there. I think her office is just around the corner. Um, but it's that kind of shift. Now we have tracked some of those lessons, or some, we've tracked some of the examples from the UK attempting to draw out the lessons. Here's one of the challenging ones um, in Exhibition Road. I think the difficulty there is there isn't the intricacy of openings and movement to and fro to make it feel safe. So there is an improvement. But I don't know about you, whenever I go down there, I still feel that taxis are coming at me at 30 or 40 miles an hour. So the perception of it is that it isn't massively safer. But we've studied them all. We've studied New Road Brighton um, and seen that. And, and that works quite well, unless, of course, you're blind. Because that's where some of the difficulties arise with these conditions is how do we make them safe and inclusive for everyone? <coughs> this is great. Uh, you'll all probably have seen by now Ben Hamilton Bailey demonstrating how safe it is by lying down in the middle of the tram. Um, and he, did, he does it, I mean, when he did this in Dundee, he nearly caused a riot with the police. People thought he was some kind of suicide bomber or something. Uh, we had terrible trouble with that. So, but you do get the eye contact, the whole concept becomes alive. We do understand what is going on. The difficulty is, how does it work for other users? The, the shared surfaces are more questionable, certainly for some people with, with mobility impairment and certainly for blind uh, and otherwise poorly sighted people, and also it's to do with the rules of how the guide dogs are trained. So there are issues there that, that haven't been fully solved yet. 
big issue in so many places we, we've studied in the UK, in Ireland, and particularly in Northern Europe, is the cycling one. This is Bordeaux again. So that's almost the idealized. This is a tram route, but it feels safe for a whole range of users until, of course, the tram silently comes sweeping by you. Um, but sometimes places are uncomfortable for cyclists. More and more, we're trying to make it inclusive and safe for anyone of any age to go. But my argument in, in studying this is that we've got to be careful that we don't just focus on cyclists. The key lesson, I think, is to make it comfortable for everyone, and I think we've got to put the pedestrian first. Cyclists come next, maybe. Um, I put different kinds of mobility impaired. Um, and here's a good example of, of the much improved crossing at Sheaf Square in Sheffield. Now, the other thing we've been learning and studying is about pop-up activity like parklets. Uh, I've picked, because it's a nice visualization, I've picked a North American example from Boston. But this is taking just two or three parking spaces. But it can begin to radically change the perception of a place. Now, I know, I think I showed this in court, and people said it was all, my right thing, it was all very bourgeois. I think it was Jazz's fault because she told me I should wear a tie, and therefore I thought I was a certain kind of person. You can do this anywhere. It, yes, Jazz knows it. Yes, you agree. It's, <laughs> but the idea is you can do this kind of thing anywhere. Maybe it doesn't need the fake plants, but you can do the seating anywhere. Um, the examples we've seen, that's another American one. This has been used in the trials uh, and, and trials and tribulations of, of Sophie Hall Street in Glasgow. The one on the right, there are a whole range of those, which are actually bars which can be used at night. You, go out, you can get out with your drinks. Um, there's another example. Some of the biggest <coughs> temporary and pop-up examples we saw first were in Budapest. So we went, I think, from Helsinki, where everything was planned, and organ organized, and orderly, and we went to Budapest, where everything seemed chaotic, but fun and vital and, and really creative. So I've got to say I voted um, for for Budapest that year, but not based on that, that point on. Many of the examples we showed and people showed us were of finished schemes in different places. And the big issue of environmental and neighborhood and community change is that it's progressive and it's incremental. And we sometimes need to remember that it's achieved over several stages, often over many years. So this is the kind of 1970s transformation of Buchanan Street in Glasgow, mainly by painting lines on the street and putting a few pot plants there. And that's what it looks like now. Literally, it was there. I hate to say I was actually Christmas shopping on Saturday, and that, that's what it looked like without the sunshine. There is something subtle about the shift going on now. This is what we might have done in the 1980s. Big bollards everywhere, um, vehicles still getting everywhere. Yes, you might accommodate a bike. It's not amazingly pedestrian friendly. And that's the kind of shift. Yes, it's more pedestrian friendly. The bollards are lighter. The vehicles can get in if they need to, but it's not prioritized to them. But there's much more cycle space. So you're getting a sense of a, of a shift, a gradual change in how things are being planned. This is the um, Socky Hall Street one I mentioned. That, if you've been following Twitter, that on the right is substantially in place. The trees are planted, and they're still finishing the last bits of paving. And I think it's, um, who's the, is it Chris Boardman, who's the, the, the czar in Manchester? He's the one who's been retweeting a lot of this. Uh, so that has transformed from a very, very wide one-way traffic street to something a little bit more manageable. I still fear for the interaction with, with um, some of the disabled and so on, but that's a different issue. The one I'm gonna put up is the one from the cover. This is in Aberdeen and it's Belmont Street. And I think it's one of the best ones by Gillespie. He's one of our major sponsors for many years. White footpaths, but there is a curve, there is a drop. There's a traditional a camber in the middle. If it needs to take vehicles, it can, but it feels totally comfortable to walk or cycle. Or, and because the cobbles are flat, they're flush, it's comfortable if you're in a buggy or a wheelchair. So there are examples, that I, and it doesn't need any bollards either. So neighborhoods, at the next level, um, and just so you know, he's, we're past halfway. There, there are plenty. Because <laughs> I know some of you are a bit worried about the pressure. Um, health and inclusion was a big issue everywhere we went. And the ones I was impressed with were often poorer places who put their residents first. So I can think of Lisbon. At the depths of the crash, 
deeply affected like Ireland and Greece, uh, really trying to turn th things around with the likes of um, participatory budgeting for residents and so on. But this issue of how do we make places feel attractive, inclusive, safe for everyone. Now, this might look like some noir movie set in Nottingham. <laughs> or, uh, these are actually our assessors. Um, it's a bit scary, I know. Uh, but they go out and, and they went around different places and they identified that things like people of different ages and backgrounds were an important ingredient. It's one of the key, if you read, I think it's in Death and Life of American Cities, it's one of the key parts of Jane Jacobs' work where the ability to comfortably absorb strangers in your neighborhoods is one of the key indicators of a safe and convivial place. And it's often something that people are uncomfortable about when there are strangers in the neighborhood. Um, what they found is that sometimes neighborhoods could be all the same people and they're not very welcoming uh, to outsiders. So that was a critical factor. We found in the likes of Vauban in um, Freiburg, that had been carefully thought through and planned from the start with particular emphasis on safety for youngsters. Because it had, I mean, this had been a military base, as I recall, the, the, bar the barracks before. So that, that was a key element. And it isn't just the young that need to be planned for. We talked earlier today about uh, aging and about dementia-friendly environments. That is a critical factor in terms of mobility, awareness, uh, comfort. Um, that one, Chris has lost that one, they've wandered off. But it's the ability to, to get in and get access to places, not just the shop, and not just the house, a whole range of, of places. Um, some of the key ones we picked out in, in livable neighborhoods was access to food, access to cafes, restaurants, markets, fresh food. And some of our worst neighborhoods in the country have virtually no fresh food, fruit or vegetables available at all. And it's quite shocking. This is a good example, I think it's from Barry St. Edmunds. Some of the, fun, the most fantastic ones, of course, we saw in other places, uh, like, I'm going to pick Italy here, but there were so many others. I can think of Valencia Market was one of the most stunning markets I've ever seen in my life. Uh, but that one uh, is a good example. But it, it was this availability of fresh produce at an affordable level, not always very, very expensive, which uh, was the case in some places. Other aspects of health were of greater concern in Edinburgh. Um, Andrew Burrell can't be here today, but he lives in Stockbridge. So we, we, we must ask him what the driving force is for. <laughs> um, I'm sure he'll know the answer. There were other weird things about fitness and health. Um, as some of you know, we, we did an article on Chattanooga um, in, in the journal after I visited it with visiting one of our academicians there. That's a climbing frame in a main road over a bridge, um, and they, they clicked it onto a car park. And I'm not sure I could envisage anyone really wanting to go there to climb and feel safe, but th that's what they thought was an interesting approach to health and, and activity and outdoorsness. I mean, basically, they've got a huge river next door, the Tennessee River is next door. You might as well go out boating and, and if you want outdoors. We did get asked whether we're doing enough on housing, you're looking, in fact, some of the people in this room asked it uh, occasionally, you're looking at development, you're looking at neighborhoods, you're looking at streets and so on. Are you doing enough about housing? And we were, we were going out and looking at different kinds of housing in different places and how people were solving it. But I'm glad that the Academy has now done, and I apologies, I thought this was launched before today. This is about to be launched. Uh, this is our research uh, and recommendations on housing for the 21st century. But there are a whole range of really good examples. So when it, it comes out, please look at it, because it is a concerted approach to look at it from an urbanism perspective in terms of mixed use, in terms of a density, of livability. And there are some really good examples from a whole range of different places around um, Britain, Ireland, and uh, Northern Europe. One of the key themes coming out is that Towns and cities are more livable for people than they were. The reasons that many of them got squeezed out in terms of air quality and, and smoky industry and anti-social behavior and all those kind of things, they have substantially shifted. Um, lots of the industry and employment uses now are, are perfectly compatible next to residential. So many people we found, particularly in, in northern European uh, countries like Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, and to a certain degree parts of Belgium, but a little bit more iffy there, People moving back, and, and often those are strident, I'm not allowed to use the word pushy anymore, I've been told, but assertive young people, uh, professional, 
uh, who've got a voice in, in councils and so on, and they're, they're, they're actually making an impact. So they're getting more schools, more nurseries, more shop, more provision. So they're making it more vital for everyone. They're almost a pioneer species occupying and reoccupying space. So it's quite important. And some of them are doing really innovative things with things like self-build and so on. This is an example from Edinburgh, but we know from Scandinavia and elsewhere uh, that, that that has been a big issue. But I want to pick out the, the odd things that, that sometimes stumped me about attractive neighborhoods. This is in Bologna. And Bologna's got a, a green space on its edge, and there are gardens, and they, they, they look after the plants and the gardens, and this is a horticultural center where they grow them. But they, they use it as a venue as well. People sit in the bits where the tubs get watered, and it effectively becomes like a nighttime venue. So this issue of temporary, it's not that the, the plants aren't there and you can't buy the plants, that still happens. But it's a multi-use and it's a very convivial neighborhood space. So there's something about rethinking space for people with a different kind of community focus. And George Ferguson said it very well, and this is on the now on the seventh one out of 25. Um, it's about the people, not simply the architecture and the built form, it's the curation of the activity and what's around for people to do. So there you literally have a mayor of a city dancing in the street. Okay, he's not Mick Jagger or David Bowie, but he's maybe the next big, best thing uh, to Martha and the Mandelas. That's some, for the young people here, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but if you remember um, Band-Aid from 1985, if indeed you were even born then, uh, that, that's what I'm referring to. And George had to explain that as an RID president, that's what he meant by good urbanism, not bigger, shinier buildings. And that's a big part of what we've been about sharing and learning. So it's about places for people. This was heavily industrialized Bordeaux waterfront. For hundreds of years, this was big commercial space they got transformed into people space. That, that's really quite dramatic. And not all spaces are attractive and comfortable for everyone. Um, and although these are great works of art, they're actually signifying um, almost the intimidating spaces that some people can find. Sometimes they're not comfortable ethnically. They're not comfortable religiously. Sometimes people are not comfortable going into them just because of their own perceptions. Um, we went in when we were in Derry to meet the Apprentice Boys. Now, how many of us thought that we would be sitting down, meeting the head of the Apprentice Boys, discussing um, identity? Um, his, his roots, I think, were in Rhodesia, weren't they? As those who were there. But that kind of thing where we have to get beyond simply the bricks, the mortar, the urban design. It's often about the people and how safe they are in their spaces. So it's very important that the huge advances being made in Bradford that we heard, and some of the best examples we've seen as an academy have been the Nordic countries like Denmark and, and Finland and Sweden trying to address the influx of migrants from all around the world, from different parts of the world, and, and make them included. It's also about age. How do we make sure places are comfortable for younger people, but also for older people? And that includes hills and slopes and things like that. It's not simply about the, the cultural comfort, it's also about the physical comfort uh, too. And I'm not suggesting that we slide old people down the, the street like the Park Street there. This is more about it's a bed, so we need to draw people in and share space. So this is generally easier at town level, at city centre level. Sometimes this is harder at neighbourhood level to, to create that comfortable space. But as you'll recall from the uh, urban charter, the sustainable urbanism charter of Freiburg, is that livable neighbourhoods are absolutely critical. So we've got to take some of that uh, thinking and lessons uh, into the neighbourhoods. And I'm going to show you an example just before the end. What we've learned, and, and some of us in the room are doing this all the time, so I recognise that many of my practitioner colleagues in the room, uh, like me and like others, are out working with different communities. Professionals, non-professional, maybe retired professionals who, who want to, to, to put something back to their community. How do we get their voices? Um, the woman on the right was at a participatory event, but sort of not. 
Uh, it was her Hindu, and I'm not sure that she would remember this very well, but she gave us really good views. Um, the one on the left, some of you will know that we've, we've worked with, um, we've worked in St. Albans, with Luke St. Albans. This is our recent Harvard, the one for the, the, in the same authority, um, and you'll recognize some of the faces around there. But it, it's, it's developing and testing alternative ideas together, and then trying to, to get towards solutions. Um, thankfully, the group on the, about the left, even though they're older, do remember what they're doing because I've seen them since, but I'm not sure about the, the, the lady on the right. But she was great. Um, we are, as an academy, beginning to do more of this, recognize communities and, and support them. So there's been the, the, the program uh, that Loyana and colleagues have been involved in. Some of them are there uh, working with different communities. Is that the Sheffield one? Yeah. 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 But happening in other parts of the country. So communities and the networks that they have are important. How are they supported? Well, the evidence we found is that many of them are self-supported. Lots of the leading neighborhoods and communities we've come across, they're working on neighborhood plans. Some of them have got design codes or bylaws that they've, they've had introduced. I'm thinking of Bourneville there, uh, licensing. That's this, the, we did Soho as a finalist, the, so the sex shop or sex trade licensing, whatever it is, uh, I didn't do the visit, so I don't know. Um, that was important because it was about managing the issues that were often perceived to be a reputational problem for the area. Community trust, conservation trust, you see the different kinds there, and, and also in some places they had the resources to have an architecture or urban centre. A bit like that example in Bologna, where they have a model and people can come and discuss uh, the current and, and future issues of the time. But crucially what people need is this, they need the passion of local people, like this lady that we met in Bourneville, she's in the Bourneville Trust Network. And she was fantastic. She had passion, she could explain the history, she, and that energy affected other people and how they wanted to contribute to their neighborhood. So the people issue is crucial, and we've seen it in Coin Street as one I can think of as one of the early ones that stood out, but we've seen it in so many places. So the landscape is different now, as I've said earlier, and maybe this is where we need to be thinking. We need to be thinking about aligning much more with the communities than maybe the background between uh, professionals and government that we had in the past. But also, we have suggested universities and, and the, the, the cities or the local authorities. We did some work on this. This was innovative work. Um, it was undertaken by one of our ex-directors, Sarah Chaplin. In fact, sadly, she had to stand down to do the work. But I know, I think, uh, Janet and, and um, John Worthington, I think, were involved in supervising that. Really innovative work on what we would know as an urban laboratory setup where there's partnering and sharing of knowledge between the university, the local authority, the community, and it could be business community as well as residents, and the academy. They already had it uh, when we went to Gothenburg. That's exactly what they were doing in River City. We're now finding other places are doing this. This is a very positive way of using, for instance, the research, the PhDs, and so on, to build up the shared knowledge of a place and make it available to the community, not have it inward looking uh, for the university alone. So a lot of this is about helping people share the ways of seeing change in their place over time. Uh, a bit like going to another place, which we did on our Liverpool visit, and it, it, it's almost like a Jack Vecchiano painting, the one on the right, I think. Um, it, it gave us a different perspective on the communities along the Wirral, uh, on the other side, and along the Mersey on, on the north side. There's something about looking at something in different ways. Is this just a market? Is this just someone cycling? Or is this someone out for his very healthy uh, cycle around and, and it's contributing to the fact that he's maybe 80 or 90 years old? Um, in other words, it, there's a whole range of things going on. Like how can we see it? The danger is that we take an overly narrowly professional view on it because we've been trained in certain ways. I was working in this place called Royston in Glasgow. And there's a lady came up to me at the end of the, the kind of charrette, the visioning exercise, and she said, well, the problem, the problem's the bins. And I said, oh, okay, so being a facilitator, a preventative. So, is it the litter? No, 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 it's the bins on the hill where the bus stop. Oh, I said, no, they, 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 they're blowing down, they're getting blown away. And she said, no, no, it's the bins, they've taken them away. So I said, oh, that, that must be a real problem in terms of nuisance and, and, and she said, no, Kevin, when I walk up that hill, 
I used to sit on that bin completely out of breath. That was my, she didn't use the word respite, that was my place to sit waiting for the bus. And the, the danger is for her, it was almost an issue of not quite life and death, but it was it was affected whether she could go out, whether she could get to the shops, whether she could see a doctor, all those And to me, I was thinking about it, you know, what's the local authority service? How do we do something about this? But it was her lived experience that was different. And that's the shift we have to get from a professional supplier side in terms of what we're selling to understanding what their needs are. So sometimes we have to get above ourselves, above the place. This is the example from above um, the museum in Aarhus. And it's, we've almost got to look at our own places differently and share that. So professionals and non-professionals, politicians and non-politicians, and journalists and non-journalists together and understand it as, as we think they've done elsewhere. And sometimes now it's not simply about the physical place. It's about the stories and it's about the digital place. So many things now in terms of interpreting uh, reality or interpreting non-reality, we can do on our mobile phones. When we started the academy, we didn't appreciate that within a few years, on, in your hand, you could have virtually access to all of human history, in terms of documents, all current intelligence, almost anything is available, including spatially. Um, and now there are apps that people follow around in terms of the penguins that take them to places. And it has a huge impact on where people visit in Tokyo and elsewhere. So the world is changing, so we need to think about that. So this idea of fixed and rigid mindsets about place, we have to move on from. And some great examples have come from the likes, I'm gonna pick more hoops again, but this is a temporary installation. This isn't permanent, but it helps people rethink the nature of that space uh, near the cathedral. This is taken from the tower of the cathedral. So we're really talking about different ways of conceptualizing our neighborhoods, our towns, our cities, and even the component parts of them. One of them is to take the ecosystems thinking and apply it not only to green space, but apply it um, to an ecology of workspace. The example on the left is the line in the Western Harbor at Malmo, where there are large players like Saab and small startup businesses, and they meet every month. And you get a, a growing supplier network of people who come out of college and, and, and they start to play in, in the bigger network. Others e exist. Uh, I, I've got to tell you, when I showed this in Derry recently, the Stroud pound, they said, no, no, don't copy Stroud. You want to copy Letter Kenny in Galway, I think. No, not Galway, in Donegal. So there are other models that are people, but, but that idea of the internal circulation and capturing it in, in the neighborhood. As George Ferguson implied, the curation of the space and the activity, the software as it were, as opposed to simply the hardware of the buildings, and this is great coming from an architect or ex-architect, that's where the future is. And I just wanted to show you an example that the Academy has influenced that I'm aware of. Byers Road in Glasgow, running just at the edge of here. This is a road joining Byers Road. Not amazingly attractive. Um, my office was at the end of it. They were a finalist, nothing to do with me. They were finalists in the awards and they didn't win. David Taylor from here said, not quite up to scratch, it's not really a winner. They need to do a good bit of work to transform it as a people place. But it has potential in the wider neighborhood because there's higher density all around. I got on uh, with some of the local people who were disappointed not to win, but realistic enough to say we do need to improve it. And we created the Byers Road Improvement Group. And we, we looked at decluttering, simplifying, and working with uh, ex-academicians, Willie Miller and Janet Benton and others, they came up with a design for a flexible space in there, and you can see it for different uses, and that we got funding. That funding would not have come about if the community had not been involved. That, that money came because the community were involved. They created a flexible space. It was taken over by the Business Improvement District, led by my wife, another academician, um, and they curate a whole range of activities in that small space. So they have summer events, uh, they have winter events, they have community events, they have awards, and they've recently done the Christmas lights. That's all in a micro space that's been transformed because people like us in the community, in local business, uh, and designers mm -hmm. here and want to transform it. It got awards two weeks ago at the Scottish uh, Annual Quality and Planning Awards, uh, one of the top awards, uh, for what it had done and what it leads in other places. So we can have an impact with these 
micro uh, spaces. To conclude then, we're trying to build resilience, we're trying to reposition places, and we have to reposition the academy. That is not from us, obviously. Um, that uh, was picked up in Gothenburg. I think that was someone, someone in, in, in the market. It could have been a political party, I don't know. But there are lessons from places like Freiburg, where if they can bring Catholics and Protestants together to worship occasionally in that one venue, we must be able to do more with the different players. And one of the key things that we've done that's already a huge positive, and we've got more expectations for this year and next year, is our Congress. We piggybacked what happened in Copenhagen initially, then spun out into our own Congress, uh, organized largely by Tony Reddy, um, with support from other people like John and, and if I can call it, Tony's mates. Uh, we got people from Cuba and, and things like that. It was, it was a fantastic event. I put that up. Was anyone at that event? Okay, so you can remember. I was, but I'm not in the picture because I was about to do the next. So I remember looking and thinking, why am I not there? But I think Sarah and I were prepping the next session. So um, the, the, this seems, it's not a big leap to go from Dublin to Cork. Uh, but we've traveled a long way in those 11, 12 years, and we had a fantastic congress this year. We've grown in scale, we've grown in impact, the outreach uh, in terms of Twitter and social media, as well as the numbers and the sponsorship, was phenomenal. But it was the experience of meeting people and sharing with local <coughs> people um, and local situations. I think the Nana Nagel event was really the one in the top right uh, that set that up so well. There you are, there's how to do a proper climbing wall. It isn't just the Congress and the gathering, it's the experience. How many of you were at this one, when we had our dinner in Bradford on the stage of the Alhambra? Yeah, you remember that one. And it's the power of the memory of the experience. How many of us thought Bradford was as interesting as it was in terms of the background and the galleries and the places that we visited? So a lot of it is about engaging with people in a way that, that creates positive stories that we can share and take to others. And it's wonderful that a lot of the mantle is being picked up by the young urbanists who are doing their own thing. They're not, it's not a command and control structure we have here. Lots of initiatives, we're hearing about new ones uh, in, in Glasgow and Sheffield today uh, with more to follow. So, so good luck. I'm particularly jealous of the cycling trips to uh, Holland and things like that. It'd be nice if you invited some older people occasionally. Uh, but I think that's great. Um, I'm only joking because someone's going to come up and say, well, we did get invited. But um, the diagnostic visits are where we can help places. We can provide support, knowledge, insight, and advice. And we've been doing it. It's something we can do more of. But it doesn't have to be a diagnostic visit to do a local place partner. We can do so much more. We've also got to get their stories out, like we did here. Um, Richard and David talking to local media, radio and TV, about the qualities of places. So I think we could maybe do more with different kinds of media, even if we do recordings and post them up ourselves. I think there's something uh, to be picked up there. But maybe the big thing is um, something that, that my old boss, Francis Tills, taught me, and others. I don't know, is anyone here who knows me yet? He said, are we having fun yet? So however, how, however dark things got and difficult and pressurized, He'd always say, you know, we've got to have some fun. We've got to enjoy what we're doing. So part of it is in terms of urbanism, it has to be fun. And we have had some fun, haven't we? Here we are with Morph at our dinner in Bristol. And Morph is now bigger than ever. If you follow Morph, he's, he's all over the world. And that's Peter Lord. I, I think that this issue of fun is also an underpinning of the creativity we need to address urban and rural problems. So it's not, I mean, most of you think of me maybe like Brian and others as kind of dour Scottish guys, Andrew, you know, we're, we don't come with bags of funnels, but we do know fun is needed in the right place. Ours is just a bit drier and a bit harder and so on. But we need the fun and the creativity because that's how we unlock problems and solutions. And the kind of leadership that jazz provides, I don't mean jazz who's on our board, I mean jazz the musical form, the improvisational nature of jazz, thinking on your feet, but you've got the skills and the knowledge to approach it, um, that's how we, we can create greener places, uh, more comfortable places. And that kind of creativity, we need to address huge 
national and international problems. Um, and it's that kind of funkiness we can, who would have, any architects in here, who would have built somewhere like that? But it's quite dramatic in its impact. So we need more of that greening, not just at a local uh, urban block scale, but at, at, a, at a town and a bigger scale. So there are a whole range of possibilities out there. We could apply more. So my contention in, in the conclusion is, cities are not separate from the global ecology. We're worrying about rainforests and areas that are depleted in Indonesia and particularly now in Brazil because they have a huge impact on, on the global livability. So the environment will survive, it's humans and our livability. On it. We need to address this in towns and cities and make them greener, more livable and, and able to adapt. It is possible, we're doing it in some of the best places, but it needs to be of a scale that we can have an impact. Otherwise, it, as climate change works its way through and it's hugely dramatic, small interventions won't be able to make a difference. So, in my lifetime, the population of the world has more than doubled. In some of the people in the room, it's more than trebled. We're now heading to 8, 9, 10 billion people on the planet. We need to think about urbanism and creating places that are positive and livable for everyone. And there, are, there will be people in there you will recognize that's when our trip is to Istanbul. And they're grappling with that because they're getting huge waves of in-migration to Istanbul from Anatolia and elsewhere. And they're, they're trying to mix higher end, greener places uh, with structured neighborhoods, in this instance around a mosque, with higher density. Um, there, there are a whole range of things they're grappling with. But we've got to do it in a way that makes sure that it's habitable for them 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years down the line. And we're not doing it adequately enough at the moment. So that's the big challenge we have. Uh, as I move from that group to that group, with our honorary president there who we're seeing tomorrow, um, my reflections would be this. We need to work with communities, not just ourselves, professionals, our, our urbanists and urbanists. We've got to support communities. We've got to try to help diversify the ecosystem, not just the, the, the physical environmental ecosystem, but the network we work with, communities, developers, and the investors, the people who would bring the money into the package. We've got to build resources and resilience. That's funding resources, but it's also intellectual and knowledge resources to, to do things. We need to move beyond a London-centric focus and have a greater regional outreach across England, Wales, uh, and, uh, sorry, Wales is not a region, uh, England, England but, but nations like Wales and Scotland and Ireland and beyond. If we're gonna have a bigger impact, we can't just look at these islands. And we, we are getting requests from South America, from the Middle East, and to do from China. The model I talked about, the university model or the urban lab model, or as Dundee I think is going to call theirs, the observatory, because of course they've got a Patrick Geddes legacy. We need more of those kind of vehicles where the knowledge and, and the academic side supports the communities and the places. We need to secure more <coughs> local sponsors, investors, banks, builders, uh, and, and some of them we heard from Tim today. Uh, earlier on are not even in the sector, but they're from different sectors and they realize what we've got to do. We need to both learn from and share international intelligence, but we have to share that as a global intelligence. And it's not to do with globalization, it's to do with wisdom and knowledge and how we pass it on. Last three, we need to support and nurture real places. A lot of what we've done sometimes has felt, you know, we can veer towards the academic and the high <coughs> We've got to make it real. But a large part of that means a voluntary effort on our part. So there is an issue we can get on our area and sometimes get paid for certain parts, but a large part of what we will do will be voluntary. And therefore, I think we may have to look at and keep re-looking at charitable status. And I know some of my colleagues have looked at that already and said it's quite hard, but I still think we may have to create that vehicle. So finally, my parting words then are, we've got to make the case for diverse livable cities and neighborhoods but the purpose of it is a far greater one. It's not just because it's nice to do, it's because uh, we must have it. So thanks very much. I hope you've managed to uh, bear that out and I'm sure you want to drink in the break. Thanks very much. <laughs>